All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're getting ready to start the panel. My name is Matthew Fogg. I'm a retired Chief Deputy U.S. Marshal with uh, 30 years, over 30 years of uh, law enforcement. I've had a chance to work on a lot of dragnet operations around the country. I was uh, uh, doing the heightening of the war on drugs in the 80s. Uh, I was assigned to DEA, cross-designated as a special agent, group supervisor of Drug Enforcement Administration, along with my U.S. Marshal's duties. Uh, I was also uh, ran drag nets. We had drag nets going in California, in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, Miami, all these, all your major cities. So I had a chance to work with a lot of different police departments around the country, understand the, sort of the, the culture, we call it, the mentality. And as well as understand the war on drugs and get a full understanding of what was really going on in that war on drugs. That's one of the things that made me join this organization called LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, LEAP.org. And I'll just read you a little thing. It says, LEAP is made up of current and former police, prosecutors, judges, FBI, DA agents, corrections officials, military officers, and others who fought on the front lines of the war on drugs and who know firsthand that prohibition only worsens drug addiction and illicit drug market balance, including our civilian supporters. LEAP represents more than 40,000 people in more than 80 countries, and we've grown bigger than that since this since this, this publication here. Please consider joining us and helping us to achieve our goals to educate the public, the media, the policymakers about the future of the current policies and to restore the public's respect for pop police, which has been greatly diminished by law enforcement involved, involving the enforcement of prohibition. So that's the reason why LEAP was formed, because we as law enforcement officers felt like we needed we were the reference group on the inside. We needed to let the people educate the folks and let them know what's really going on out there in this so-called war on drugs and how it sort of jumps off with a lot of the problems that we see and we're having today, and even with our communities and this disconnect in our communities, that whole war on drugs. And uh, just to let you know on our panel, we also have Michael Wood. He's working on his PhD. He's 11 years uh, with the Baltimore City Police Department. Uh, he worked in drugs and narcotics. Got a pretty extensive record. Uh, he's he's of the younger group, the hip hop group. Uh, uh, he's got on the back of his shirt, Black Lives Matter. Uh, he had a chance to be out there to understand, to see it firsthand. Uh, during the generation that he was on board, he understands why the war on drugs is a failure. And then we've got Howard Woolrich. Howard's got about 30, 40 years <laughs> in law But Howard's got many years in law enforcement. But the biggest thing, Howard's uh, one of our founding sort of in the beginning when LEAP got started, Howard was around. Uh, Howard does a lot of the lobbying for LEAP up here on Capitol Hill. So he makes certain that the uh, that the Congress is aware of what's going on and why LEAP is important. He's going to tell you about that. He's going to tell you some of the legislation that uh, we are pushing through. He's going to tell you some of the groups that have uh, supported LEAP up on the Hill, some of the Congress folks and who they are and why it's so important that uh, people get involved. In this, uh, in this organization and continue to help us to fight this stuff. We know today, we hear the term Black Lives Matter. We hear the term uh, why now there's this sort of real disconnect with the police and us, well, police and the public. And I got a chance, and I gave you a little bit about my background, but I got a chance to work in that field. And while I was working it, I always remember the one thing that stood out to me most of all was when I, when I, when I was setting up, we were setting up some of our drug and gun interdiction task forces and DEA, and, and I remember uh, one of my managers called me to the side because I was concerned about a lot of the areas that we were targeting. And I was concerned about that. I was concerned why these areas all seem to be urban areas. Get your numbers up. Go out there. People, public want to know that we're warring on drugs. And remember, you hear this term, war on drugs. So the issue was I came out and I said, okay, we're warring on drugs, but why are we just going into the urban areas? Areas mainly where, the, you know, minorities. And I remember this manager telling me, he said, Frog, you know what? He said, we understand drugs everywhere. He said, but if we go over there and we start messing with those areas, where those more affluent, where middle class, white America lives, he said, let me tell you something. He said, they know judges, they know lawyers, and they know politicians. He said, before you know it, we're going to get a phone call and they're going to shut the operation down. He said, so let's just go the way we know we can get our numbers up. And at that point, I said, well, man, that's ethnic cleansing. So what we've got here, and I say this all the time, I say, if the war on drugs was an equal opportunity enforcement operation, we wouldn't be discussing this today. 
So we got to understand that. The war on drugs became about race. And then uh, suddenly, of course, when we heard, I think it's Ehrlichman from the, from the Nixon administration, came out and admitted it in the news. He said the war on drugs was about race. <laughs> it's a race war. So we now, and with all the information that we got now, we've learned that the CIA, we had Maxine Waters one time looking into it, and then they caused her to back off. But bottom line was we begin to understand how a lot of the drugs are being brought into particularly black neighborhoods, flown into the country, Compton and L.A. and different locations, major cities, being by our government, being deposited in large quantities into urban areas and cities around the country so that it did become a race war. It did become no longer what we call the proverbial war on drugs. It was a, a war on people. And that's what these guys, that's what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the legislations, how this thing has occurred, and what our role was in it. Each one of us played an extensive role in this war on drugs. I look back on it now, and I, I get sometimes I get a little down about it because I realized all the people I was running around and tracking down and the stuff that we was doing, and I was excited. You know, I'm getting my numbers up. I'm doing them. Doing, but then one day I had to really stop and think, this isn't fair. It's unequal. If I can't go over there and lock them up, and they had the best stuff, the pure stuff. They had the good stuff. <laughs> we run around with this all chopped up stuff. And I'm telling you, and then if I couldn't go over there and get them, then what am I doing? So it's sort of like in law enforcement, you know, you learn what is called the fruits of the poisonous tree. You learn the illegal car stop. You learn when if you violate the law to sort of enforce the law, then in court that's going to be thrown out because you violated somebody before you, you violated the law in order to try to enforce the law. That's what we was doing in the war. And that's what I say to this day. We have violated the law to enforce the law with this so-called war on drugs. Therefore, it all should be illegal. And therefore, if we looked at it from that perspective, we would say what we've got is a lot of people that are in prisons and jails and so forth who used, shouldn't have never went to jail. But because cops wanted to get their numbers up and everybody felt like, hey, man, and I, you know, I had cops saying, hey, man, why are you worried about that? He's still a drug user. Don't worry about his rights. I mean, he doesn't have any rights. You see, we become the judge, the jury, everything out there. That's true. And we tell people, and I tell people all the time, you... When you're in that position with that badge and that gun on, you become like a little demigod out there. You, 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 you know, and I knew right from the academy. And then when you add that racial component in it, W over B equals R, that's my theory for relativity for racism. I say you put that in everything that you do, that little formula there. You put it in, and it'll skew the, the, the statistics every time. And so what happened was I learned fast on. If I stopped the car with four blacks in the car with four whites in it, I knew right off, whatever I said those black folks did, the prosecutor, the judge, everybody's going to back you up. You stop the car with four whites in it, somebody might say, well, what was your probable cause for pulling them over? Well, you never asked me that before. I'm just saying it, it was the culture. And now you imagine that going over and over. And then you, and then you put the war on drugs on that. That was, you might say, open season. It was open season. And then we got these great disparities in the numbers of arrests and who goes to jail. And I'll tell you, everybody in this room is familiar with this stuff, but I mean, we know that the widespread disparities on who's in jail, who gets prosecuted for the same drug, who 80% of the drug are people that are sitting in prison for drugs and so forth, are these arrests turn out to be people of color? It just, we can go on and on and on with numbers that are just outrageous. And so again, it comes back down. If it was an equal enforcement opportunity operation, we would not be having a war. We wouldn't be having a discussion because they would have ended the same way they ended alcohol prohibition. Now, what I'm going to do is I'd like to bring Mr. Wood up. And Mr. Wood is going to tell us a little bit about his experiences, what he saw in the war on drugs, how it has affected young people, some of the things that he sees in this hip-hop generation, and some of the solutions that he may have that he feels, and of course, we, we've got the overall solutions in this thing, this whole, this whole prohibition thing all total. But, but we gotta, we've been chipping away at it. Mr. Woods. All right. All right, guys. Uh, my name is Michael Wood. I am a retired sergeant from Baltimore Police Department. I was a Marine before that in FAST Team. I uh, went in when I was 17 
And none of that's really what I care about talking about right now. Um, I am here because Leap kind of wants to break out of their groupthink, and they have brought in a new generation on purpose to kind of push the agenda to a new and different thing as the horizons change. So what I'm really here to do is that I want people in whistleblowing and in that generation that's ahead of me to know that you guys have had some success that you have to look at that are, it's so hard to see when you're involved in activism because you just take the losses, you see the losses, you see the losses, and that's all you see. And what you've been having, I haven't been here, but I bet you've been hearing a lot of, we have to have courage building, and we have to, we have repercussions, and we have to end the information denial, you know, that people don't think that this is really happening. But we, even in our cultural zeitgeist now, we know that Serpico's a hero. We have tons of people right now that are fighting for Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning. So you're getting to us, you, your message is being heard, and the, and the denial is largely over. So what we're transitioning to right now is building structures, okay? So I knew all these things. I, I heard your messages throughout these years, and it still took Freddie Gray being martyred for me to unzip my mouth. So what we need to do is we need to make it so it's not Freddie Gray having to be martyred so that someone can finally open their mouth. So my whistleblowing isn't, is past this, this current stage of standing up for money or standing up for the right thing. It is now to the stage where we're indicting the entire system that leads us into this. And so Snowden didn't have a system that would enable him to speak and would enable his voice to be heard in a way that doesn't land him in Russia in exile. So if we we're gonna to move to the next step, that means everyone has to partake in building this framework and this structure that we need for whistleblowers who now do see to have the courage to step up and do it. Um, I've heard it said that failure is the point at which you realize you're on the wrong path, but you keep doing the same thing. And that's where we are right now without these structures. We're on the right, wrong path, but we know it. Right? So up until now, we've just been learning. We will only fail if we try to change at the moment. So we have to continue to learn that we're failing in policy. Right? So we don't have the structures there for that. We're failing to support these whistleblowers. We're failing at saying Black Lives Matter. We're failing at stopping the drug war, which we know does not work. Empirically, we know that the drug war is a war on people and has every, it doesn't matter what angle you go about it. You can take a libertarian perspective and now you're government oppression. You can take a Republican uh, conservative idea and you're wasting money like I've never seen money wasted before. You can take an uh, empathetic level from a progressive or a liberal perspective where you just want to do things that aren't racially biased and hurting everybody. So I don't care where we are, failure is a continuation of this very same system. So after I broke the, we'll call it the blue wall silence, you know, I don't know, it's a weird thing to say. <laughs> but, uh, so I've moved to this discussion to real solutions. Like we have to talk about solutions and we have to take the sensationalism. So it was a, it was a really cool deal. And a big, a pretty white boy from Baltimore that had a badge started standing up for black lives. You should never take a pretty little white boy with a badge to stand up for black life and somebody finally pay attention. Right. So right. We, we know this now. I'm here, Matt's here, Leap's here, Howard's here, we're all here, we all know this. So my PhD work is on this idea called civilian-led policing, which I'm just tentative for now. And those are the ideas about solutions that I'm talking about, even if so I have the PhD side where I do <coughs> scholarly work to get that done. And you can have that lane. You could be somebody that's in your neighborhood that has access to reporters, and you can have that lane. We all have these different lanes where we can build up this framework and finally uh, do those things that get us on the right path. So I've been uh, shocked, and, and I, I'm kind of ashamed that I'm shocked. And, um, I hope you guys aren't shocked, but after I came out and started speaking up, my inbox has been flooded with cops from around this country who understand exactly what we're saying. 
They understand that Black Lives Matter. They understand the implicit bias in everything they do, we do. They understand that whistleblowers need supporting. They want to speak up, but they don't have the structure. So I'm taking it upon my personal mission to build the structure and to advocate for other people to build structure in their own way, in your own neighborhood that you have it. I mean, everything's going to be different no matter where you are. But we have to open our eyes and we have to open our minds. And uh, I hope you can see that the reason I dress like this is so that you know that no matter what, when I have that uniform on, you can see that thing that you expect. You can see the clean-cut white boy, the Marine still in there. You can see the crispness. You can see the long sleeves. And I look like that enforcer. I look like that serious person that's coming out here to do business. But underneath that uniform, I'm that tattooed freak that's standing next to you at Walmart. So that's what we all are. Even when we see the system as being bad, those cops still are that tattooed freak that lives next door next to you, that is next to you, we wax on the weekend, wants to come home to his family, and then one of the killer reasons we can't do that is because of how much we pay the price. A cop is gonna pay a minimum of a million dollars if they speak out, because you have pension, you have benefits, you have all these things. We got away with getting pension before we got, in, got into our situations. But we have to have a system where an officer isn't being asked to pay millions of dollars in, in, in penalties for being a whistleblower. So I just ask that we recognize this in ourselves, recognize this in the system, and then uh, hopefully we can eventually put the word whistleblowing in the history books. Okay, our next uh, speaker will be Mr. Howard Woolridge. Howard's going to come forward and tell us about Lee, tell us uh, some history, give us some legislative information, tell us a little bit about who he is and why he got involved in this and how sort of a little bit why Lee got really started in the early years and how we cranked it up to where we are today. Thank you. Howard Woolridge. Thank you all for coming. I was a street cop for 18 years, three as a detective in Lansing, Michigan, moved to Texas, rode my horse across America to advertise uh, the failure of policy, war on drugs, and the rational solution is to treat it, of course, as a medical issue. The war on drugs has been the most destructive, dysfunctional, and immoral, immoral policy since slavery and Jim Crow. And that's why I've dedicated, if necessary, the rest of my life to end this policy, and I will work on it until I draw my last breath. You know, that's been my opening declaration for the last 19 years of speaking out. I've been to 400 rotaries, and the audiences have been across the United States. I've, I've, I say, been to rotaries from, from Miami, Florida to Seattle, Washington. Uh, they're shocked that when a police officer stands up, and he kind of looks like a police officer, and he says things like, every drug dealer ever arrested, shot, or killed has been replaced, just like that. And the drug dealers accept as a condition of employment, death, and long prison terms. And that's why 30 years ago, when this Congress here in D.C. passed legislation for mandatory minimums, uh, they've had zero impact on drug availability. And we knew in 1986, when the Congress passed these laws, they were, going to, they were going to be completely ineffective, but we, as a profession, <coughs> stayed silent. Why? Because I've learned in my 10 years now of representing LEAP in the Congress that law enforcement, our chosen profession, the profession we love, is here for the money. The money is what, of course, makes this town go round and round. And, of course, that's money for wages and money now, of course, for civil asset forfeiture. My profession has become corrupted and is addicted to the tens of billions of dollars you give us every year to go after mostly black and brown people. And being an addict, we don't want to give it up. When my colleagues from the Sheriff's Association, the Chiefs of Police Association see me coming down the hallway, they know I'm here for one reason, one reason only, to take away their money, their lollipop, their candy. And they don't like it and they fight as hard as hell to keep that money coming in, of course, especially that free federal money. Um, the, uh, the, the failure of policy is, is evident to now everyone in America. It, it, the polls are showing about 80% agree. This is failed policy after 45 years, a trillion, T Tom, trillion dollars of taxpayer money spent, uh, and drugs are readily available. 
This is a, this is a quote from the DEA pamphlet, readily available to America's youth. This is an abject failure, as the president said a while back, and uh, it is now time that we look at this as a nation, admit it to ourselves, and what we try to do in LEAP is turn thousands and thousands, millions of skeptics who think, well, maybe if there's another new way to fight this thing or make prohibition successful, it will be. No. We've given it every possible thought and strategy for 45 years. It's time to admit that we need to end the war on drugs and the rational solution has been to legalize and regulate all drugs. And then if you have a drug problem, you see a doctor at a clinic never a judge in a jail cell. So the, um, the, found, the foundation of LEAP was in 2002. Five police officers from around the country found each other, if you will, with the new emerging internet. And we came online, we formed LEAP in the spring of 2002. And our, our mission was to literally blow the whistle on the drug war, drug prohibition. And that we've been doing by going to rotaries, Kiwanis, churches, Democratic clubs, Republican clubs, meeting with citizens 30, 40 at a time saying, here's why it's not working, here's why it will never work, and the rational scientific solution would be to treat all these drugs as a, as a medical issue. Um, myself, I've been to 400 rotaries, etc., and it has changed. It has changed a lot of people's opinions, and that's why we are in the process of changing law, both here in Washington and as you've seen around the country, we are starting to roll back the prohibition from the states. Now we're up to like 25 states with medical marijuana, four complete legalized regulate tax. We are on the right side of history and we are reducing the crime, pain, suffering, and death around this country by changing these prohibition laws. Let me just say, why am I here today? Speaking to you, and I've earlier this today, I was, of course, doing my lobbying efforts uh, in, in the Congress. Why am I not riding my horse around the lake in Texas today? It's about the kids. Young people in this, in this country, and by extension around the world, are suffering pain, suffering, and death because of prohibition. No one in the Congress, no one in the media speaks to this. I do this because the government tells me that today, as you and I sit here, 900,000 teenagers are employed in the drug trade. And although it's hard to get statistics on gunshot victims in this country, another topic, my librarian and I put it together, we feel comfortable in telling you that every day across this country, 20 young people are shot and or killed because of their employment in the drug trade. That's why I'm here today. And no one ever speaks to this issue of teenagers being shot and shot and killed. The other reason is also involving young people, and that is we are missing, ladies and gentlemen, we're missing pedophiles in social media. My grandkids living in Columbus, Ohio, and Darien, Connecticut, I can't be there today. I can't protect them. i got to get my colleagues those detectives that I used to be, out there chasing the pedophile. I've arrested pedophiles. When we talk about marijuana policy and people start to giggle and want to pass out brownies, yeah, it sounds really funny. But when it comes to police work, it ain't funny. Because my profession is wasting millions and millions of hours chasing a green plant, Willie, Snoop Dogg, and the rest. This makes my blood boil. It drives me to go to work every day. Because we should be protecting our children, not worrying about whether Willie Nelson is going to get lung cancer or not. But again, as I said, the, the common denominator in Washington is the money. Now, my role here in Congress is to, ad, is to advocate, to educate, cheerful news. We now have had a bill that came very close last year to passing in the House to repeal the 1937 law that made marijuana a federal issue in the first place. And so the good news is, more cheerful news, my colleagues and I, there's six of us who pull the wagon, are confident that in the next uh, administration, we will put on the president's desk a bill which will repeal the 1937 law, apply the 10th Amendment, and make this a state's rights issue. And so when Colorado and the rest choose to legalize, regulate, and tax, that's their affair, and the federal government will not interfere. We are on the march because we are on the right side of this issue, 
The, the non-cheerful news is there are still, there was last year 27 Democrats voted to keep the war on drugs, war on marijuana going, the war mostly on black and brown people going. And so we, my, my work is still there and when I leave here today I'll go back to the, uh, to the House office buildings and try to convince more offices to see the light of the, the wisdom of the Tenth Amendment. Now, um, the one thing that, that uh, uh, every whistleblower in this, in this room and across the country knows, the, the, the meaning of an ancient proverb, and that is, if you are about to tell the truth, always keep one foot in the saddle of a very fast horse. Yep. Everybody in this room knows that, and the audience knows that. Because the person telling the truth is always the first one to be shot out of that saddle. Welcome to our world. That's right. It's so, it's, and it's, this is not just academic. My wife, when I, when I got, found this great woman in 2007, she, the first thing she absolutely insisted upon in our marriage is that I go get a concealed weapons permit so that I could defend myself. Against who? The Mexican drug cartels. We are in the process. LEAP is the only national organization saying we should end the entire drug prohibition. Ladies and gentlemen, this is something close to a hundred billion dollar uh, industry. The Mexican cartels alone are making about half that, fifty billion dollars. We are trying to take away a fifty billion dollar paycheck. That my wife is scared for my safety, she should be. If the Mexican cartels were smart, and I'm glad they're not that smart, they should be shooting the three of us up here on a daily basis. Because we are the ones rocking the boat. And so, and I did get the permit, and she feels better now that I can got I can't carry one here, but when I'm back in Frederick, Maryland, I do. So, uh, at the international level, LEAP sends uh, myself or others to uh, Vienna every year to talk about this on a worldwide basis, and we're trying to convince the leaders there that we should end the worldwide prohibition, as I speak in Congress, to, to end the national prohibition. This should be a, there's, you know, there's seven billion people, one size doesn't fit all, but again, it's the money. The head of that organization is a Russian, and the Russians are making billions off the drug trade, plus they, it forces the United States to continue it. Yeah, it's all about the money once again. So, uh, I'll leave you with this, and that is uh, uh, <clears throat> that, the, that 45 years ago, POTUS, the President of the United States, told my profession, 700,000 cops, that we are at war. Now he said war on drugs, but as, as we've seen and we know, this has been a war on people, almost exclusively of color. And I called upon the White House, I had a good chat with three White House aides a couple months ago, POTUS, Mr. Obama, before he leaves office, needs to stand up and address the 700,000 cops in this country and tell us that the war on drugs is over and that we should not treat all citizens like a potential enemy combatant. We're seeing this now in the horrible cases in Minnesota and Baton Rouge, whatever, where you make a furtive gesture and on a traffic stop and we just shoot you saying, well, I thought he might be going for a gun. That's what guys do in war, Michael, as he knows, combat veterans. If a guy twitches on the street, you shoot him. That's what we're doing to American citizens because we're approaching every citizen like a potential enemy combatant. We have got to, we have to de-escalate that, that mental thinking. And that's why the president has to do it. And I, if you have any contact with the White House, please urge the president before he leaves office to say that to my profession. We need to get this, uh, this situation squared away before he leaves. We need to declare peace. We need to declare the end of the war so we can treat people with a drug problem as they should be, as a patient and a clinic. Thank you. Excellent, man. We got some good, good, good people in this organization that are well versed and understand the war on drugs and what it's all about. I always kind of go back, you know, it's kind of funny, and look at, I bought this paper, but you see what that says? It says, bigots with badges. Okay? And this was the front page of the New York Post. This was done, a story done on me and my colleagues in the U.S. Marshal Service uh, in 1997, okay? And then, uh, then of course, the, the final call did one on me, took my SWAT team picture, shouted me out and said, under the shadow of death, black U.S. Marshals fear for their lives. 
Okay, so what, what, see, the problem that I've really got with this whole war on drugs, and definitely we understand it's all about money and everything, but it's even more than that. Slavery was about money. Everybody understands that, right? Slavery in America was about money. And, and finally, when we got the, the Dred Scott decision, of course we think a country went to war, brother killing sister and brother, all over what? Because they want to keep their human property. And then people up north said, if they run, them, them slaves down south, they run up here, run up north, they, they be free. And they said, if you come up here and try to get them, we will shoot you. Now, what I'm seeing in the war on drugs, I'm seeing a correlation here. Because again, like I said, if we was talking about something that we could sit up and say, all right, well, we, we born on everybody. We, if you got drugs, you're going to jail. We know it would have fixed itself the way prohibition did fix itself. We know that. So we know this is really about slavery all over again. Today there are more black folks in the institution, criminal justice system, with either PD number, with, a, with either probation, parole, than there were slaves at the time of the Civil War. So this is about the second slavery. I tell people that. And when I look at why it is so hard, especially for certain people to get it, because you know why? Because it's not affecting them. You see, a slave, a lot of people say with slavery, there were a lot of slave owners out there saying, you know, this isn't, this isn't right. But since we're doing it, I might as well have me a couple of slaves. But this ain't right. I, I wouldn't want nobody to take my child from me. We got people in our generation, black folks in our generation, we, we always wondered, you know, wow, sometimes we would be so hard on our kids. Because somebody told me one day, they said, you know why? Because for hundreds of years, those babies that were born on those plantations, those mothers knew that they weren't going to be able to keep them. They're going to be sold away, so they couldn't get close to them. So that was generational, generational coming into our communities. So what I'm saying, when you got a war on drugs, you got slave, when you got that type of thing involved, it's just like we talk about gun violence. Gun violence has been going on for how long? Decades in the black communities. Suddenly we get Calvine and all of this, and what happens? Oh, this is terrible. We got to do something about it. The same way with the war on drugs, the same way. Now people are dying. Now heroin, this, they've had a resurgence of heroin. Uh, is it the meth, methamphetamines and, and the meth is coming back. Now people are saying, oh, this is a terrible sickness. Oh, you think? See, what we got is, that's why I said W over B equals R. You got to put that formula. You got to put it in while you're walking, while you're thinking, while you're breathing. We see officers shooting these people and we see on TV. We get it on videotape now. You know, the videotape shows the guys on the ground up down in, down in uh, 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 Louisiana. He's getting on the ground with the autistic guy. Florida. 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, he's getting on the ground. He's, he's talking. He's autistic. I'm getting on the ground. I'm his counselor. He's got, I've got my hands up. I'm doing everything. They had me down in Florida. They had me on the news. He said, well, Father, what, could he have, what else could he have done? I said, play dead. I didn't think. I mean, it's almost like you, you get to a point where they're aiming at this guy, and then they, then they shoot him, and then they, the, the, the guy that got shot, when the officer came home, he said, what you shoot me for? And dude said, I don't know. Hmm. It's like a plausible answer. They tell us from the academy all the way through. If you shoot somebody, you kill, you use that deadly force, you got to come up with a plausible answer. Now that they have plausible answers, I don't know. Or either he was wiggling. He twisted a little bit. He didn't do everything I could. We got so much discretion out there. We can kill and all of that. So can you imagine mixing that into this so-called war on drugs? We, we know from the cat, I can kill, maim you, mess you up. And I didn't see that so many times with guys. And I can just justify it. And y'all are going to believe the police officer when they go into court. Now, somebody mentioned about, how you mentioned about uh, the cartel killing us. I'm going to be honest with you, when I was going my operations, I take the bullet. I was on the SWAT team. I take my my metal plate out, play, double plate the back plate. All right. I was more concerned about the dudes behind me than any drug deal on the street. I can tell y'all that straight up. Them people wasn't my problem. It was them folks behind me. That's what I. Was. Anytime a New York Post say bigots with badges against the U.S. Department of Justice, you know it's it. But again, we see the same type of culture of the war on drugs happening on the inside of police departments. So we said ourselves, what do we do? 
Yes, it is about slavery. It is about two Americas. When that Colonel report said in 1967, it said America is moving into two directions, two societies, one black, one white. I'm saying moving, it's always been there. It's how do we reconcile the societies. We've always been two societies. And I don't care if you're young or old. All you got to do is walk around and see what happens and see who gets locked up and see who gets thrown in jail and see how our system operates and you begin to see it. Now, I, what I like to do is you guys might have some questions you may want to ask us, but I just kind of, it just made me think about every time we try to look at this whole war on drug scenario and how do we try to look at the race aspect of it as opposed to all what is right and what is wrong in this thing and the money involved in it, then we begin to see, well, now you got two, you got two situations occurring here. And you got an America that still is in the mindset that I know it's not right, and just like prohibition wasn't right, and we stopped it because prohibition was affecting people to the point where it was affecting a certain side of society. They said, "Oh no, we got to stop this," but they haven't stopped it with slavery, they haven't stopped it with the war on drugs because they say it's only affecting them. As long as it's affecting them, we're gonna dig in and say it's got. We gotta have it. The war. We, we still need to do this because we want to save people. You don't want to save nobody except for yourself. What's your question? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Alfred, you know me. <laughs> I just had to make you laugh. First of all, I thank you so much for this panel. Uh, I did not get your names. Michael Wood. Michael, Michael Wood. Wood and Howard Woolridge. Howard. Michael and Howard. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. I'm only sorry there are not more people here, but I'm really going to press that um, we get this message online so that people understand that there are officers that get it and that are articulating in a very profound way. But my primary reason for getting up here is, Michael, yes. I saw you on Facebook and I was impressed. I said, oh my gosh, he's come forward and he's from Baltimore. How are you doing? Um. Great. Uh, it's been a, a wild ride. Um, when I first came out and there was sensationalism around it, um, I decided if I was going to have to talk about this, um, because I, I kind of had more imperative to speak about it, that I was really going to have to know what I was talking about. And during that time, I've been in Baltimore, uh, deeply entrenched with activism and growth the grassroots down there, and I've uh, just subjected myself to a, uh, a mentoring of the street. And it's been uh, painful, but in my view. So how are the other officers? I'm assuming you're no longer working for the Baltimore Police Department. I'm sure I've been fired by now, folks. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Um, how are they treating you, notwithstanding the fact that you are not entrenched there? They're afraid of me. They're afraid of you, so you're not getting the retaliation. No. You're not. See, that's the difference between being black and white. Right. Because they can't do anything to me. They can't. Oh, no, they could. If they arrest me, black. nobody's going to believe them. Um, okay. They would if they were black. Without they would. question. <laughs> that is really important. And one thing I really want to stress is that is the preference you enjoy. And notwithstanding the credibility of a black officer, even no matter up how high up in the food chain he may be, if he were to ever do what you did, and I commend what you did, he would not have the benefit of walking free as you are. So I thank you for taking advantage of your preference. Privilege. Privilege. It's privilege. There's a lot of privilege that makes me yes. feel good. Yes. I thank you for taking advantage of your privilege for us and for my children and my grandchildren. And I have one other quick question. Your work, I just went online to see your organization would leap, my goodness. Yeah. you I did not even know that this existed. And I thank you for this. I never connected the two, Matthew, of alcohol prohibition and drug prohibition until right. I attended this session. Um, making that connection is ingenious. Mm -hmm. And what we've got to do, and I'm this going to have to be another thing I put on my plate, like it's not overflowing Good. enough. Good. Um, is to help everyone to be educated in the connection between the two historically and what that means for black America, for both venues. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you. One of the ways you can help us, I've been doing this for 19 years. One of our biggest stumbling blocks in the black community is the churches. Mm -hmm. Drugs are bad for you, so let's keep them out. Let's keep them illegal, etc. The black churches overall have been one of our biggest biggest obstacles in changing the votes of the black community. Now, in Congress, uh, 40 of the 46 uh, congressional black con congressional members voted the right way to end the war on marijuana, uh, but six of them still voted to completely continue this horrific, uh, you know, new Jim Crow. <clears throat> Thank you. We will talk because I, I can work with you on that. Thank you. Michael Howard, Matthew, I just want to echo what my friend says. And David's a, David's a former U.S. Marshal, retired uh, chief, okay. U.S. Marshal. It's always hard to follow up. Uh, Howard, man, you guys are incredible. I've uh, known Matthew for over 30 something years, and I have to be very honest with you. I had no idea what LEAP was until now. LEAP in my world, law enforcement availability pay. That's all I knew LEAP was. That's the 25% we get on top of our income. <laughs> so this was this was very enlightening. And, and you you answered my question. You just had a comment and I actually had a question, but you answered my question. But I'll just continue. Is there anything else? What, what can we do to help? That's all I have. I think it's really spreading information. Um, I hate to crack on the older generation all the time, but you guys just aren't seeing the real world, and we can communicate in rapid fire succession. Anything that we do uh, can be preserved for forever, so you can always refer somebody to it. Knowledge is now at the fingertips, so spreading that knowledge is, is really all we need because all this work and all the questions, there's somewhere where this has been documented, and a speaker, a speaker gave a passionate speech with stats and everything else in it. It's just getting uh, people to watch it and absorb it. Thank you, Senator Awesome. Super awesome. Hi, um, Janice Walt Grenadier. Um, I, I, I want to address both both issues. But number one is with Lee. Um, we have a whole new generation dying every day of drugs. I mean, every few minutes, I think. And I know um, I have daughters, 24 and 25, and one of their little friends, you know, died of an overdose. And mm -hmm. the guilt that goes with is the whole family thing. And it, it, you know. I had to say it, but it's become a white issue now as well. And um, so, technology <laughs> is te technology is one of the ways that I'm going after the court system. But one of the apps I just um, did at a hackathon is called Kev 911, and it was so kids could hit the app and find the closest person that would have the the shot to reverse the overdose. Because these kids aren't calling for help because they're afraid of the jail time. I was talking to one young boy who had was nine people, and that included the mother of his son, who he's watched die and not call the police because they don't they don't have the good Samaritan laws in place for it. Let me just address that. Uh, in 05, as I was writing a Horse Across America as a lead project to gain you know, uh, converts and, and educate the public, I gave to a wonderful woman out in New Mexico, Santa Fe, the what the Europeans do, which is an arrest-free 911 call. Rita Zipensky, uh took that that the real uh, crude idea, fam formed it into a three-sentence bill. Governor Richardson signed it. Uh, in 2007, becoming the first state in the United States to have the arrest-free 911 call to save a life. Right. Happy to tell you, there's now 17 states. Virginia just didn't pass it. That that have that uh, arrest-free 911 yeah. call. I can tell you, at the federal level, the FOP, my old organization, as a union steward, fights that that concept, saying we don't want to mollycoddle uh, drug users and uh, uh, let them go free with for simple possession of heroin. So there's still resistance, but there is progress that has been made. But yes, that's another thing that people need to work on is that a rest-free 911 call uh, in, the, in the next 33 states uh, and in the United States government. Um, Don Edwards had a bill that six years ago it didn't go anywhere. And it's a real important issue because we do have these young people. Mm. Our young people, even my girls, have been yeah. raised to run from a cop instead of their, their, their friends. And let me just say, that's this, this is the right moment. Now that white people are dying, People are paying attention. They do want some. Uh, they do want solutions. Narcan is a solution. Uh, there's a lot more pressure now because of white people dying to solve yeah. the, the problem of people dying of a heroin or cocaine overdose. Right. Um, my next question is for you, though. <laughs> okay. Um, I was illegally jailed and 
held for 22 days, 14 days in solitary confinement in the city of Alexandria. And um, I basically, I was tortured in there. I mean, it's not the kind of torture where you pull out someone's fingernails or anything like that. But in solitary confinement, I was moved around from cell to cell. It looked like I got comfortable. They banged on my door every hour on the hour at night. Um, they sat me down after I snuck out documents and said I had less rights than if I had murdered somebody. I was not allowed to file any more documents. I did get out 20, uh, 22 days instead of the 30 days I was sentenced for. I was sentenced um, for $8,100 in legal fees that I didn't have the money to pay because they'd already taken everything from me. And I can go on and on, but I don't want to do that. My point is, we are turning into Nazi Germany. We have police officers who are not thinking about what they're doing and their conscious is not into play. That they can sit there and do that to someone like me who had never committed a crime, who had done nothing wrong, except if you wanted to say I was poor. And for that reason, they were gonna do anything they could so that when I walked out of that jail, I would commit suicide, to try to mentally break me. What they did is they empowered me. I didn't eat the full 22 days and I went and drink water that wasn't in a bottle on it. So you're going to ask a question. So my question to you is, how did we deprogram these cops to say, you know what, you do walk into the courtroom, and even if the judge doesn't like it, you got to tell the truth. Right. So, and you can't. But yeah, that's a ridiculous conscience. idea that we just had in, in Baltimore, that you had cops refusing to testify to a criminal case, and the legal system allows that. So right. think about that for a second. So right. you see that everywhere. But my, my overall reform, and I don't like to get caught up in band-aids. I mean, think about it. Narcane and stuff like that, they are band-aids for what is harm reduction. The drugs, drugs aren't killing those kids. The drug war is killing those kids. They're not overdosing on the Oxycontin when they have it. They're overdosing on the heroin because it's poor quality when they get onto the streets and they can't get their Oxycontin anymore. So we actually know the, the pathways that those go. So ending the drug war it would, would do so much more harm reduction, period. Than the, than any of it. But my overall PhD work is a lot of people think of uh, civilian accountability in the disciplinary process, and you have that board uh, talking about when things have been brought up. So my fundamental philosophy is you take that civilian accountability board panel and you move it all the way to the top of the chain of command. And if you do that, then the police are actually serving civilians. So even when you're talking about correctional officers or cops, they all serve their own system and have no desire to succeed. If cops are supposed to be fighting crime, then actually stopping crime would prevent their entire existence. So they have no motivation to do so. You have to have a system in place which continually feeds itself to do the right thing. And the only way to do that is for complete civilian oversight. Otherwise, we're looking at mandates. So do you think it's our judges who have put them in a situation where they will walk into a courtroom and lie? because the judge wants to hear a certain thing? Right, everybody's a part of the situation, though, everyone. So it, it doesn't matter what avenue you take in the criminal justice reform, you're gonna find implicit bias, whether it's bail, whether it's arrest, whether it's a drug war, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's whether black police officers get promoted or not, you're gonna see implicit bias in every single angle. See, but what he, and just add on what he was just saying. Now, that's the big review board he talked about. See, that would throw a monkey wrench into a lot of the other stuff, because if we could stop stuff before it went to the next level, had the right people there, that could really have a major impact. It's not, all, it's not a fix-all, but it's a great, a great part in the process. That's what we say. We have to go right there. No uh, we're literally on the wrong path. That's right. There's we can't no go. Right. We There's can't no go on this path. Right. You know, when you buy a cell phone, if it's broken, you don't get satisfaction at the store. You go to the CEO and you get satisfaction. Right. In the government and with our police, that's with because our the government, CEO serves you. we have nobody giving any type of accountability or any type of service that is protecting the people on the street. And that's why we have Bernie and Donald Trump doing as well as we did. Well, of course. All those things you're saying are, are well aware. Yeah. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> we're a little bit preaching to the choir in, this, in, a, in a group that ends up in this room. <laughs> Mike McRae. A couple of things. And you guys are wonderful. I, I really appreciate the, what Lee does and your presentation, Howard, Michael, out of sight, Matthew always, and your, your co convener of the summit. So all of that's excellent. Um, first question is it seems to me like the message of Leap is starting to take hold as we start to see states decriminalizing and, and whatnot. The, um, as an organization, you know, what, what, what's, what's LEAP 2.0 once you, once you win the war? 
That's me. So uh, that, that, that's the point of uh, my existence, of why Neil kind of brought me in to lead to begin with, is to mold that because we are going to win the drug war. So we need to have a perpetual <coughs> thing that continues on into all the avenues of police reform. I know Neil's talked about prohibition as a general concept, which we battle over because of guns. And you can read my articles. It's a very different uh, perspective than his. Uh, but w we can move on to things like uh, prostitution, which is another consensual adult agreement that we're harming communities by enforcing and not finding uh, better things for it. But as long as we continue to hunt and we change policing as a concept to fight the causations of crime, not the symptoms of crime, then every crime that occur will give us a new battle to fight. So when we, we find the shooter on the street, instead of figuring out how long we're gonna put him in the jail, we should be figuring out how he got to that situation that he's pulling a trigger, and that battle will never end so we can have a perpetual system that will continue to improve. Where did you get your Online. Uh, we just add that the, the, the war on drugs is simply is not is not the law. That's a strategy to make prohibition effective. Right. As Nixon right. declared in, 19, in 1971, we've had prohibition on cocaine and heroin since 1914. <coughs> so ending the war on drugs is step one. Step two in the lead mission statement is to re, is to end all uh, uh, prohibitions, meaning we should legalize regulate all drugs. And then pass that to Michael's point. Right. Once this, that is the single greatest evil mm -hmm. in America today, is prohibition. Absolutely. And it's associated with war on drugs. After that, leap will probably go on to, it'll more probably in 20 years, into all consensual adult behavior like prostitution. Because once upon a time, we were peace officers, not moral enforcers. And so that, that is a long-term strategy. I can tell you, as a co-founder, it's a long-term strategy of LEAP, but because the, the, the drug prohibition causes so much evil in America today, it's the number one evil, uh, we're working on that first and foremost, almost exclusively. And number three, and number three, just that, no, no, number three is gonna be, number three is gonna be, let's make sure they don't come up with something else. <laughs> That's gonna be number three, because we see that it seems like this is by design. Of course. So once we understand that, we realize some eyes lurk and say, well, if they fix that, then let's come up with something else that continuously to have this disparate impact on people of color. Well, I think that one, if you had to, if you're having troubles with the black church over marijuana, once you guys move to prostitution, it's going to be uh, all <laughs> that's, that's in 20 years. Don't, don't take your eye off the ball. It's, it's the cocaine and heroin being sold in the streets of Baltimore that are getting these young people killed. No, 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 I, I get that. I agree. Um, Mike, when, you, when you're talking about your PhD, I, well, and I know that um, Janice is a judicial reform activist, but really the concept that you just gave is the problem with the courts as well. It's the judges are unaccountable to ordinary Americans. So that, that's a it's an interesting model. It's something we should work on kind of throughout the justice system because if you're not, if the, if the civilians aren't involved in somehow the management and the oversight, you know, then we are really just the, the we're an occupied, an occupied community. Without question. Yeah, yeah. And um, what else? Thank you. I mean, you, you had a question, right? Yeah. Uh, Do you mind? Could you go to the mic? Because they're going to get it quick. Thanks, man. <laughs> feel like it's such an intimate gathering. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I uh, wrote an article recently about the Blue Lives Matter movement. And it's not just a slogan. I realize it's actual. It seems like it's an actual constellation of cops, an ideological constellation. I went to their Facebook page. They have a major Facebook community. And it's, you know, active duty cops, uh, retired cops, their family members. And they're making fascist statements about killing Black Lives Matter protesters. They are talking about bombing entire black neighborhoods. Right. Um, I'm sure it's stuff you've heard, uh, but now it's become kind of part of the presidential campaign and you hear you know, at the Republican convention and so on. Um, I wonder where you see the origin, origins of this movement um, and you know, what, just what your general thoughts of it are. Um, you know, what role does it play? Have you seen anything like this before? Um, and then just another thought based on what you said about, you know, we're worried about something else coming along to replace the war on drugs. It's pretty obviously the war on terror. That's how Bill Bratton is getting all this money go. in New York. Um, that's the language you hear about 
um, and, you know, we're at war now with, you hear Sheriff Dave Clark compare Black Lives Matter to ISIS, so um, I wonder what your thoughts are going forward on confronting the war on terror uh, rhetoric and the uh, war on terror mentality that you see. Well, let's, let's well first of all, you, work, you write for alternate. He writes for alternate. Right. Okay. Um, so, like, let's not get caught up in the minority of uh, loud voices. Uh, that are out there. Um, I don't see them physically very often, and when I do, they're pretty darn small. The uh, way I combat them directly is in their own rhetoric, that it's, if Blue Lives Mattered, then we would see them carrying at the intersections of Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter with officers like Jaquai Colson from PG County, who was killed merely because he looked like what they thought was a suspect being a black male, and so they killed him, just as they did with William Torbett in Baltimore. Right. So if blue lives care, then I need them speaking about the black lives that are murdered by friendly fire, so-called friendly fire, on the streets of our cities from the same implicit biases that are killing black men in car stops. Um, as a, I don't know. I mean, the, the, your, police have this us versus them mentality, and it's going to come out in everything. So whenever there's adversarial, they just think, they think that these movements are anti-police, and these these movements are anti-police policy or anti-police brutality. So you internalize it in that us versus them mentality is, I mean, ending the drug war, it, it's kind of like a self-feeding <coughs> cycle that if the drug war is ended, then you're not occupying and you're not having that war, so you don't have that us versus them mentality that's going to continue on even when it comes to uh, brown people in uh, being subject to things from the war on terrorism when we know that a right-wing Christian guy is 50 times more likely to commit a terrorist act in America than a brown man is. So if we can focus a little bit on facts, then maybe we can get to a place where we're actually caring about blue life. And just a quick little follow-up. Um, one of the things that I'm, in my case, for example, in the Marshalls, this came out this whole article, Bigots with Badges, uh, which is going to be the name of my book. I've almost got to finish. But, but let me tell you, we've got a lot of subversive, you call them a KKK, we've got a lot of organizations that have infiltrated, extreme white organizations that have infiltrated police departments all over the country. We know that now. The FBI has talked about it, has reported this. So what we're seeing is we still got this sort of institutional policing that was really designed almost to keep black communities in check. And now what we're seeing is now it's all across America and what's happening is people are talking about it a little more now. But that what scares me is that these groups are there. They're, they're well seated in. It's like we've got so many guns in America. Even if we do come up with common sense gun laws, if somebody wants to get a gun and kill somebody, they're going to find one. So it's almost like how do we take these police departments and change them? And we learn real fast. And I tell everybody this, when you saw what happened in New York City with Mayor de Blasio, he simply told his young black sons, he said, look here, he says, if the police stop you, he said, we know the record of most, a lot of blacks get, you know, uh, <coughs> profiled by police. He said, so just be careful. That got back to the union. Thousands of the cops, not all of them, but thousands of them turned their back on him in uniform. Now, they've done something like that in the military. They've all been court-martialed. But they did it, and guess what? They did it twice. And I told everybody, I said, y'all missed it. They sent the message to him. You mess with our culture. Not only will you find your son in the alley somewhere, we'll turn our backs on you. So that's the culture that we're dealing with. We're dealing with this deeply seated, bigoted, racist culture that's inside. And they try to walk around like, we're good. And so anytime something comes up like Black Lives Matter, it's, you coincide that with the civil rights movement. They said... So rights move, they said that was at, you know, we were, uh, we were wrong or, or that they saw that as subversive civil rights movement. So what I'm saying is anytime you speak up for your rights, they put it in that couch in that category that, that we're wrong. So Black Lives Matter is thrown out like that. Donald Trump is up there saying it and everybody's saying it. So we need to, we need to understand that the sheep, actually what Donald Trump did was pull the sheets off America. I said, he started just coming out saying that what people have been thinking all along anyway. He just saying it like for, uh, the, the, the Republicans who didn't want to hear it was like, well, you can't say that. The other was like, hey, let, let's, let's rock and roll. We feel this way. So that's what's scary about it, is these various groups that are in this country that are wealthy, they're now beginning to come out. And that's why I'm really scared. You're talking about race war. That's what Dylan said when he went down there and shot those people in the church. And guess what the police did? They took him to, was it McDonald's or? Wendy's. 
Wendy's. They took it to Wendy's. Burger King. Have it your way. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. So I'm saying to you, we got to really realize that that's what we're dealing with in law enforcement departments. A deeply seated still. We got a lot of people in these departments that shouldn't have never been cops. And they're there, and that's the way it is. I'm and sorry. I, and, let me, and let me just add to that. And I work with racist cops. What the prohibition laws do is give my profession, our profession, the tools to hurt people we don't like. Right. So, yes. and, I, and I just, especially when people got cameras going, a guy I work with named Mike said, Two niggers, two greasers, two chinks, or I don't stop the car, why bother? And he is symbolic of hundreds, right. a, a, significant, a significant minority of our profession. The drug laws give him the ability to go into every car he stops. I smell marijuana, get out, right? If you want to have at least a, uh, a probable cause statement. And that's why ending the prohibition will, I think, <clears throat> cause tens of thousands of police officers to quit the profession because they're in it to hurt people of color, right. people they don't like. And I should add, just for the record, uh, when I was uh, a cadet, basically, uh, there's a guy I used to ride with when I had to who didn't like gay people. He'd stop a car when he thought the guy was gay. He would, he would make his fingers get tired writing more tickets. <laughs> this is what's wrong with police work. Uh, when you hire bad people and uh, people who want to hurt others, and that's why ending <coughs> prohibition will be such a, a wonderful step in the direction of race relations in this country as you declaw, if you will, declaw the, the racist police officers when they can't hurt people of color. But Woolworth, and the Amber Woolworth just said, the problem is, though, the good cops know who the bad apples are. Oh, yeah. We know who they are. So if we, now, this is the problem I always say. If I know that bad apple's out there and I don't say anything about what he's doing, he hit him 10 times, I know he didn't have to hit him 10 times. And I said, well, you know, man, I go to the guy, man, you know, he shouldn't hit him like they shouldn't have done. But the problem is, I'm just as complicit. Because I always say, if a guy comes up to me and he says, and, and I'm telling him, I said, look, man, they shouldn't have killed your son. What they did was wrong. I saw what they did to him. They beat him mercilessly and all that. And I'm telling another person, that, a civilian, that because some of my buddies, police took him out. You know, that dude's probably going to look at me and say, well, why didn't you stop him? Why didn't you jump in there? And I remember one day, I'm in the cell block. They got this dude all hemmed up. And one guy, this white guy, he had one of these black batons. And when I walked around, I heard the guy hollering. And he had the guy's ankle wide. He's wrapping it. And he's taking his ankle. Bam, bam. He's hitting, working his ankle. Down. And I walked in. I just, I just grabbed his arm. Boom. And, he, and, he pulled, and then he pulled back and drew back at me. And I said, you going to hit me now? I look at, and he, he had rage in his face. And when I saw it, and then he went and told on me. He went and told, fuck, I'm stopping him from making a, I'm stopping him from subduing somebody. And I told him, man, and because the boss knew me and knew the type of person I was, he said, fuck, I knew you. I said, man, that dude was brutal last night. Man. And he said, I, he said, I know, he said, all right, let's just leave it off. But I'm just saying you that culture is there. Go ahead, Mike, you got a question. Yeah. Actually, kind of following up on your, your question. In general, I call BS whenever I hear a war on it. Because it's, it's a market, so fuck it, it's just to, to turn your brain. So, war on, look, war on drugs, war on terror, war on art, none of that stuff works. Um, I watch this, we, part of what we do at the summit is we honor, we, we look at journalism and, and writers and filmmakers. And last year, we were looking at this documentary called The Seven Five. It was about this police precinct in, in New York. Mike Dow. My man. And they try to get me to do stuff with him. I'm like, Daddy, I'm not still on the same stage with that cat. Uh, well, <laughs> li listening to him explain why he, why he felt like he could do that. I mean, basically, he's out with Palmer Badge. But what he says is that he knew that he was never afraid that the other officers would turn him in because basically the culture, the blue wall of silence, no one would tell on him. So he, he was fearless in, um, in his transgressions. And what they really... What, what dawned on me was when I, when I heard the interview is so in this culture, a good cop to him is someone who's loyal that won't tell the tr truth right. to, to, for society. Right. So I'm like, and then to him, the person that, that stands up for society and is here to serve and protect, he's a rat. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's like the whole world, we're, look, we're looking through the other side of the looking glass where the good cops are the bad cops 
and the bad cops are the good cops. The whole world's going crazy. Mm -hmm. And so to get to what we what needs to be done is we're going to have to figure out how to change police culture. Right. And that you know that that's the part I'm like, God, th this is a entire cultural shift. And so that more, you know, I guess that's more of a comment. And then the other question to you, Mike, when you when you got up, when you sat down, you were saying that hopefully we wouldn't need the term whistleblower or something to that that nature. Can you kind of elaborate on what why you said that? If we have proper systems in place that actually have structure and support for someone that is a witness, mm -hmm. uh, they won't become a whistleblower. They will remain someone that is just a witness following through in the system. For instance, now um, EEOC has had a, a fair amount of success in policing as far as, uh, from my perspective, that if a female was sexually harassed and she filed an EEOC complaint, Nobody in any of my squads I was ever in would view her as a as a whistleblower. They would just be like, "Good, fuck that guy." So that's the scenario. No, 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 no. I understand. It. One of the things, because it's interesting. Part part of what we deal with here, in terms of you know who is a whistleblower, what is whistleblowing, and there's there are two schools of thought. Because there are a lot of people who reject the term whistleblower, and just for for a historical perspective, the term whistleblower started being used roughly in the 1970s. Pentagon Papers, Daniel Ellsberg. Mm -hmm. The first, the first law that protected whistleblower disclosures was was written in on July thirtieth, seventeen seventy eight, by the Continental Congress. Mm -hmm. So that's why the, the theme of the conference is whistleblowers in the First Amendment. So it's really part of the civic duty to report to Congress at the first available time. That's just the mm -hmm. words. And so part of there's a tension even amongst our community because we have some people that say, "Well, let's call this." I've heard truth tellers. Lantern light lighters. <laughs> and, lantern oh, lighters. Yeah, lantern lighters. <laughs> uh, Persons of conscience. So we struggle within the community. Part of what part of what my mission is is no, let's just put the term whistleblower, let's own it. Put the term whistleblower in its proper historical context and make it be it's something that's patriotic. But anyway, I was just right, I want it in the history books. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just kind of <laughs> let me just add that in the interim to ending prohibition. The most effective whistleblower we're going to have on a daily basis throughout the country is the body cam. Mm -hmm. Body cams have already been shown in some test uh, uh, departments to cut uh, civilian complaints 50%, cut uh, officer violence against citizens 50%, etc. So in the end, realize they're going to be on TV, they're going to be on YouTube and Facebook if they just start beating the crap out of people. It's going to take them. It's going to take them long, long time to 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 forget they've got the you know or remember remember they got the camera on. Okay, but uh, so you're still going to see it. But as more and more officers realize they're going to be on camera, these bad officers, bad corrections officers, are going to stop beating the crap out of people when all of a sudden you're seeing it. Three million people are watching you, and then your kids suffer at school. This is having an effect, and if we want to spend any money. Let's spend them on body cameras because they're the best whistleblowers going. Just two, 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 hold on, two, two points on that. One is I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, but just body cameras and the cell phone and game changers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But, yeah, but then we just saw one is the um the one of them where they where they knocked the, where they, 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 they so knocked the two the, the one the, the one that shot the guy on the ground. Right. And all of a sudden they all of a sudden their body camera just but happened overall, to get knocked off. Right. There's gonna be exceptions, so, but in Chicago they've knocked like four out of five body cameras for Chicago PD, the audio doesn't work. They just don't put copies. See, break see the thing, what, what I'm saying, it's, it's, and, how, it's changing. and how you're right about that, and I said that about the body cam, but what I'm even telling the public more is make sure you have your cell phones on and hit that one little button that you can stop because that's the best way to do it. And because what we're dealing with is mutating terms. And I said, every time we come up with a solution, they mutate around it though, even, you know, to something maybe even worse. So that's my concern about whatever solutions we come up with. you got to always be vigilant that we come up with something that they, because they're going to mutate. Whenever people got this sort of, right now we got, like I said, two societies in America. And, and as long as we got two societies and the ones that are in control look one way and controlling the purse screens, then what we always got to realize is whenever we think we came up with a solution, somebody going to think of something else. They're going to mutate. It's like mutating germs. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I did the New York Justice League walk from New York to Washington with, for Black Lives Matter. Right. And um, <coughs> there was a lot of anger to the, just the few whites that were there. And they're a great group. Um, and we are late coming to the party. I mean, blacks have been doing this for a long time and trying to stand up and bring uh, 
um, notice to to the what's going on. And it was a new feeling to have that feeling of every time you see a police officer afraid of what he's going to do to you. Right. And um, one of the things, you know, we think back to our younger days of um, Andy Griffith and Barney Fife. And Mayberry. And, yeah, yeah. Mayberry and how, you know, they knew the local drunk and they never harassed him. They tried to empower him, just brought him in, made sure he had lunch and dinner right. and slept mm -hmm. it off. And they yeah, one bullet in his yeah. mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... How do we educate our police, or should there be some type of a course where they have to go back and they have to do some foot patrol and come back with 10 new friends in the neighborhood? Well, <laughs> what you're hitting on is, is management metrics and incentives. So that's what gets put in place when civilians are actually in charge. When you have yeah. mayors in charge, and the metrics that they have in place are the ones that argue their case. So they want to say, my officers are doing something, so they have this arrest, they have this ticket. So it's all about who is setting the stage and those structures and those platforms. So it's not, there's not a training class. So there's implicit bias training that's going around the country right now. And when they have implicit bias training, they're being shown that, look, this black guy is not more dangerous than this white guy. He's not more likely to have a gun. He's not more like that. So what they take away from that is not to treat the black guy with less aggression, but to treat the white guy with equals aggression because he, wow, look at that, he's just as much of a them as they are. So we have to have the entire metrics and incentives change, and that will not happen as long as you have money dominating the situation, you have an oligarchy, and you have mayors that are controlling the scene. So you must disrupt that. Anything else is a band-aid that may work temporarily. Well, and, and we've got to stop the retiring people instead of holding them accountable. Which is the same board is going to do that. So it's it all know, but but the, that's where we've got that one percent, and we've got to make our change in it. Right. Okay. You know, and even if you even if you get to a point where again. You, you try to, you can't train that bias out of people. I always tell people, if it's in you, you can't train it out. It's what you grow up, what you, the people you grow up and you're around. I, I remember in my case, we had one manager, for, and, and, it, and it does, and it, we talked about whether we talked about police brutality on the street, or we talked about internal mechanisms. It translates right to the street. The same biases, racial problem that we as black agents are having on the inside, it just simply goes to the street. It's like when all of a sudden we heard that. For the first time, we had a black president. And somebody runs all the way into the White House, and up to I think he got to the second floor, or whatever it was. It was crazy. That's never happened before. But then the black U.S. Secret Service agents got a racial class action going. So it said it shows that connection. It's like all most police departments got racial issues on the inside. So I always tell people, just like these cops bring up there, well, all police aren't bad. There's just a few bad apples. Well, can you tell me which apple is pulling me over? The problem is the, police, the public doesn't know which apple it is. So once you make that statement, you got a few bad apples. I gotta be. I, I gotta wonder which one is I'm dealing with. So you have tainted the culture. They think they're not. They think that they can say you can't throw all cops under the bus in New York City. When they turned their back on that man, they let him know this is a culture you don't mess with. And that's what I tell people. It can't be a few bad apples in law enforcement. That's like terrorists in here. One or two terrorists in the room. That's all ain't that many. Well, if it is, well, I'm going home. You go into a stadium and you tell some people in the stadium, you say, honey, down here, you're going to like kids. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, we got two, uh, we got two off police officers here. Uh, and they're bad. We don't know what they're going to do. Everybody's going to go home. I can tell you here and now, and it might be a stampede. That's what you're dealing with in this whole police culture is we've got to take get that taken out that you can't have no bad apples at all. End of the story. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. This is Linda Paulson. She's a, a reporter. <laughs> yeah, I just want to, um, question I have is, um, first of all, um, I've covered judiciary hearings at the uh, John Wilson Center in uh, Washington, D.C., and in reference to body cameras, they are, um, there are some issues with that as far as the police actually recording, um, as far as um, <coughs> auditing the cameras. Yeah. Um, so that's Editing. the issue there. And also the privacy. Um, is the public allowed to see um, what has been visualized? if a crime has been committed. So that's an issue that's going on right now in D.C. 
But my question is, as far as the war on drugs is concerned, um, back when the crack epidemic was going on, um, there, um, virtually that was affecting a lot of black people, and they were being thrown in jail, which was considered a crime, having a crack. President Obama did um, lessen the sentence on that, but right now you have a large um, thing going on with heroin, and the heroin population, from what I see in the media and what's been recorded, is uh, even though it has affected blacks for a long time, I'm from Baltimore, and a lot of heroin is coming through the port of Baltimore and spread out. But it's also affecting a lot of whites. But right now, it is not, they're not throwing them in jail. They are um, a preventive type of help, helping them a lot more when there was nothing right. um, helping um, the people that were on crack. They were just throwing them in jail. The black versus white, you talking about? Right. I was, yeah, okay. I was wondering uh, with this racial disparity, um, is anything being done with those that have been thrown in jail that have been accused of crack um, since the sentence has been lowered? I know President Obama has released right. a lot of prisoners um, on misdemeanor charges, but when those people were thrown in jail, that was not considered a misdemeanor charge. Do you know whether or not um, anything is being done? With right. That? right, since they reduced it from 101 to 18 to 1, my best information is that. The Congress has yet to pass a bill to go back and let all those tens of thousands of prisoners reduce their sentence to what it would be with the new uh, 18 to 1. They've been trying to pass it, and most of the Republicans uh, fight that. So it, it hasn't been done. Now, we're always talking here, at least officially, these are folks who are delivering crack, not simple possession. So, but of course, the, 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 the amounts were. Uh, were absurd, 101. Uh, but that was part of the hysteria of, of the 80s. Uh, and the sad part of that was, and it just, it's just a historical fact, a lot of black congressmen back there wanted to make it 1,000 to 1. Not realizing it was, that the police department was going to butcher the black community over it. But they were used to, they, they compromised at 101, it is now 18 to 1. But no, they have not gone back and released the folks based on the new 18 to 1 ratio. All right, we're going to be wrapping. Thank you, uh, Howard. Thank you, Mike. I'm gonna tell you guys, we're going to be we're going to be wrapping up right now. Uh, we want to thank everybody for coming forward uh, for speaking, and we want to let you guys know on the camera out there in the world, the land. That if you want to get a hold of Leap, it's Leap.org on the website. Leap.cc. I mean Leap.cc. I'm sorry. Leap.cc on the website. That's why. We're <laughs> anyway, that's why you need young people. That's what I'm talking yeah, about. Really. And, and uh, just go to bigotswithbadges.com. All right. <laughs> <laughs>